recording now on this computer. Welcome to What Women Want. We are now recording on Zoom and I am going to travel on over to Facebook, which is always a journey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. I'm picking our radio show page and I'll let you know when we actually go live and we push the live button here. Rolling down. We have Amy Newmark from Chicken Soup for the Soul on this evening. So exciting. She's back. <laughs> I couldn't stay away, could you, Amy? <laughs> no, I could not. <laughs> All right. I'm heading over to Facebook Live, and it should show me a live button that I can just simply click and go over there. And it is 7.58, so we're a little early, but that's all right. Okay, three, two, one. You're heading on over to Facebook Live. And welcome, welcome everyone to What Women Want Show. I'm your host, Judy Goss, and my co-host, of course, is Kristen West. And welcome to tonight's show with Amy Newmark. She is the publisher and editor-in-chief and best-selling author of Chicken Soup for the Soul. And we are so excited to have her back. She just released her new latest book called The Forgiveness Fixed, just released yesterday, and that's so exciting also. And we have a very special story. We're going to give you some insight into what Amy has experienced in the past year, and you won't believe it when you hear it. So stay tuned. We're going to get to Amy in just a second, and we would like to thank all of you. We are so grateful for you sticking with us after all of these years, five years now. Our podcast, when we had it, on LA Talk Radio, reached over 1.5 million downloads. And of course, now we're on Facebook Live and doing really well. And we're so happy that we are because we love interacting with you. So if you would like to ask Amy Newmark a question or a comment or me or Kristen, please put your comments on the Facebook page, on the Facebook uh, comments and share it and like it if you like what you hear and see. And we also are on YouTube. And we put the audio on iHeart. So if you want to listen to archives, you can go over there. Oh, my gosh. It's just incredible. After growing up in Maryland, I'm from a Maryland girl. A lot of people don't know that. They think I'm a New Yorker. I don't know why. <laughs> but I also attended the University of Maryland. And I segued into a high fashion modeling career. And after that, eventually, I found myself as a magazine editor of Moore and Cosmopolitan Magazines. And I'm now a TV host. I just finished wrapping up my third season of a show called Behind the Gates. A lot of you have seen it, a lot of you fans out there, and I appreciate when you comment and let me know. And um, it's on AWE. And I'm also a regular contributor on NBC and Fox. I'm actually going to be on Fox New York on Tuesday evening for the 6 o'clock news as a lifestyle expert. I'm an mm -hmm. entrepreneur, and I'm also a mom of twins, teenage twin identical girls in the house <laughs> it's crazy i have a company called what women want networking and conference and we just finished our third annual conference this past weekend which was such a blast and i'm honored to say that last year amy newmark who's on the show this evening was our opening keynote for the conference for our second year and we just finished our third year also, and uh, we certainly missed Amy like crazy. So, but we had a great time. We had an incredible weekend. We were at a five heart star hotel called the Whitley. And it was really a place where women laughed and learned and loved and really leveled themselves up several levels. The, the theme of the conference was it's time we get what we want. Um, so very exciting. Um, so Kristen, you know, I would love to hear what's going on in Hollywood. I know you have all, as always, several projects out there. For those of you who don't know, Kristen's in Hollywood, she's in LA, and I am in New York on the East Coast. Well, it's a fun week. Um, last week, I was with Yi Chow, our former guest. She is the founder of Global Intuition, and we did some uh, plus-sized modeling shoots for her new accessories line and I got to model some sneakers which were really cool mm -hmm. and um, next week in about a week I'm going to be at the Seattle Film Summit covering uh, the premiere of The Parish and in the meantime I am line producing two feature films at the same time which means I'm highly caffeinated at all times. 
<laughs> well, you're not talking a little fast tonight, so <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> we are. We are. We are right now. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I just love that Amy Newmark is, is back on the show. Amy, thank you for supporting us uh, through all of these years. And Amy is the best-selling author, editor-in-chief, and publisher of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series. Since 2008, she has published more than 150 new books, most of them national bestsellers in the U.S. and Canada, more than doubling the number of Chicken Soup for the Soul titles in print today. Now, Amy is credited with revitalizing the Chicken Soup for the Soul brand, which has been a publishing industry phenomenon since the first book came out in 1993. By compiling inspirational and aspirational true stories curated from ordinary people who have had extraordinary experiences, Amy has kept the 26-year-old Chicken Soup for the Soul brand fresh and relevant. Welcome back, Amy. Thank you. I'm so glad to be back. Oh, we're so glad to have you here, you know, and we almost didn't, which is so surprising because, you know, you spent the weekend with us last year at the What Women Want National Conference, our second year. And, you know, I really had no idea until later on in the year what you had been through. And I, I think, you know, it's no coincidence that tonight, you, um, you know, yesterday your book was released, The Forgiveness Fix. Um, tell us what you've been up to and, and, and what you went through. And I, I know it's, it's not like something you can kind of just tell in 15 minutes and then say, oh, goodbye. Um, but your story, you know, as usual, you're always inspirational. And when you told me this story, I just thought, you know, wow, if I ever have to go through that, you know, I learned, we always learn so much from you. Well, what happened was that I was feeling fine in Atlanta at your conference, although something felt a tiny bit off that weekend, but I wasn't sure what it was. And then went home Sunday and Monday, I started spotting. And I know when you're post-menopause, spotting is really, really bad. You are not supposed to. So I thought, well, I was just traveling, you know, maybe it was that. But then the next day, Tuesday, there was more. So I went right to the gynecologist. She did an ultrasound. She said, oh, you might have a funky little fibroid. You know, she was being very calm about it. Mm -hmm. So then I went and had an MRI. Um, but I didn't want the closed kind because I'm claustrophobic. So I waited 10 whole days to get uh, an appointment for the open MRI. I had the open MRI four days before I was leaving on a vacation in the British Virgin Islands, a non-refundable expensive vacation. But I was so laid back about the whole thing. It just didn't occur to me anything could be wrong. Saturday afternoon, I was buzzing around packing, getting ready to leave Sunday morning. My daughter called me. She said, where are you? And I said, I'm driving. And she said, you have to pull over. She's a gynecologist, and I had had the MRI results sent to her, as well as to my gynecologist. And my daughter told me that I had oh. cancer, and she was crying on the phone, and I felt so bad that she was the one who got the news oh. first. And I didn't know what to do, because I was supposed to go on this vacation like 12 hours later. So I went home, I called the gynecologist, who was you know, in the middle of a soccer game or something. She went home, read it, and... Um, we got to work, I, I, I canceled my vacation last minute, and surprisingly, Delta gave me my money back, the hotel gave me my money back, everybody was so nice. I was wow. really surprised. I, yeah, no more travel insurance for me. I didn't need <laughs> it. <laughs> Don't follow that advice though. Anyway, <laughs> I ended up going to Sloan Kettering. My daughter was so helpful. I don't know what I would have done. I, how lucky am I that my daughter chose to specialize in gynecology and the program where she was a resident did a huge amount of oncology and so she was a, an amazing advisor the surgery I ended up having she had done many times herself so it turned out I went to the hospital for ovarian cancer had the surgery come out of the surgery and the doctor says your ovaries were perfect I said what wait, I thought I was here for ovarian cancer. He said, you don't have ovarian cancer. You have fallopian tube cancer. So I you know, checked on Dr. Google. It's really rare, but it's basically just related to ovarian cancer. And so they just throw you in the same bucket as the ovarian cancer patients. So that means I had this massive surgery and then five months of chemo. Um, now it was the kind of chemo that makes your hair fall. Aww. 
see, I got hair. So word of advice, ask your doctor, if, you ever, if this ever happens to you, anybody who's watching this, ask about cold caps. It's this freezing cold cap that you put on your head. It freezes your scalp to 40 degrees. I would wear it for six hours. It was really cold. It was miserable. Yeah. But look, I kept my hair. I kept about half my hair. So now I got hair growing in, you know, under the hair that I kept. So sometimes it gets super puffy. It looks like I have a bird's nest on my head. But I came, I mean, I'm in remission now and I have my hair. And that is so so exciting. I mean, you really do. I was so impressed. Right, Kristen? Yeah. I mean, I remember the conference last year and I I would have never been able to tell you had been through something like that. You, You look very vital. No, she, it happened the day after the conference. Right. Yeah, I was in surgery a month later, the day before Thanksgiving. I had the surgery, and then I started chemo before Christmas, finished chemo in April. And I, I didn't really get all the way back to feeling good until maybe a month ago. But I really do feel good now, and I just had my six-month scan, and everything was clear. Oh, congratulations. But this kind of cancer, oh, I was stage 3B. This kind comes back for almost everybody. Of course, I'm hoping I'm going to be one of the lucky ones and it won't Mm -hmm. come back 20%, maybe 30% of patients, it doesn't come back. So I'm hoping I'm in that group. Yeah, Um, absolutely. We just have to keep thinking positive. I I know it it must be incredibly hard. And, you know, I I thought when I got your new book, I'm going to put it up here so everybody can see it. It's probably backwards though, right, Kristen? (laughs) Actually, no, you can read it. Yeah, oh, you it can read good. it. Okay, great. The forgiveness fix. Now, you know, after I had heard your story, and, and this is perfectly in time for Thanksgiving and, and the holidays, you know, so I love that because, you know, you, we were talking earlier about forgiving and family and all that. But I feel like also it, it's not coincidental that you went through that and, and perhaps you were thinking about forgiving yourself too. Because I, I know, Amy, that you are a workaholic. And, and that I can imagine it was really tough for you to experience something like that and not be able to work your usual hours and give your usual 150%. Yeah, I did feel that way. But I managed to get everything done and we're having a fabulous year and we have five books uh, among the top 15 self-help bestsellers. We're doing really, really well. So uh, somehow, congratulations. Well, you know, I always said that I admired all of our writers who had cancer because they had clarity and they were efficient. And now I'm experiencing the same thing. You, you kind of pare everything down to the essentials and I'm just like a machine and I get stuff done. But I have a much better work-life balance now because I told my husband that as long as I'm in remission and maybe this will be for the next 30 years, we are going on a vacation every other month, and I am really insisting on it. We just came back two weeks ago from a 17-day vacation. Oh, that's great. I must admit that I was on a 17-day vacation, and he worked for 14 of the 17 days, but at least I was on vacation. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, we got to get him in the show and, and teach him about some forgiving, forgiving himself. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's getting better, but... You are totally right about why I made this book, The Forgiveness Fix, because when you've been through something traumatic like that, you kind of become efficient in your life too. And you're like, I don't need to carry anything excess on me. I don't need any extra emotional weight. And so you really learn how to pare things down. And I am more convinced than ever that the two keys to happiness are gratitude, you know, knowing how to count your blessings, and forgiveness, knowing how to shed all of those resentments and disappointments and anger, because nothing good comes from carrying those resentments around with you. I can't think of one reason not to leave those things behind you. And that's why we put together this book. And it has incredibly helpful advice in it about how you can use the power of forgiveness. And boy, does it lighten you up when you forgive people or even learn to just not get mad at them in the first place. Pre-forgive them. Pre-forgive them. I like that, pre-forgiveness, because I think sometimes we're overly sensitive and triggered and almost looking for a fight. I know I do it. 
and I have yeah. to, I have to put some distance. How important though, Amy, is it to forgive ourselves too? You have to, because if you can't forgive your own inadequacies, it's pretty hard to forgive them and other people as well. So you really have to be realistic. Nobody is perfect. We all make mistakes. We all try our best. I mean, that's one of the things I learned about marriage because I'm now remarried very happily, but I went through a divorce. I tried really hard in my first marriage and so did my husband. Mm -hmm. We both tried. You know, you have to learn that nobody's perfect. Everybody tries. And that ties right into that pre-forgiveness thing too. If you can forgive yourself and know that you're not perfect, but you're trying and you're forgiving the other people and also looking to see what's behind their actions. You know, maybe there's a good reason for what they're doing or they've got something awful going on in their lives that you don't even know about. Mm -hmm. If you never even get mad, you've got nothing to forgive and you're even lighter as you go through life. I love that. And I think you and I were discussing before the show that we teach kids a lot of stuff at school, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but we don't learn how to forgive each other either. And I think that's an important life skill. Yeah. You know what they teach you in school? They go, say you're sorry. And then the kid goes, sorry. You know? <laughs> yeah. But now they teach kids about counting their blessings, right? They really mm -hmm. will focus on gratitude. They teach kids about mindfulness living mm -hmm. in the moment. These are great skills. But Kristen, you're totally right. They should be teaching kids how to use forgiveness for mm -hmm. real, not the mandatory I'm sorry thing. Right. What did you learn about forgiveness when you were reading these stories and, and bringing them all together into a cohesive book? I learned it's never too late. You can absolutely forgive somebody even beyond the grave. It is absolutely never too late. And even if the people are still living, you can forgive them without them knowing it's even happening. Because it's really just something that happens inside your own head. Basically, you just have to decide, I have created a prison for myself, a prison made of anger. Mm -hmm. And I am hurting no one but myself. That person you're angry at, you're not hurting them. They don't even know. They might not even know they did it. They might not have even done it on purpose, which is go, going back to the pre-forgiveness, like learning to not to take things personally because maybe they weren't really directed at you. But people can definitely forgive just by deciding they're going to let it go and move on and leave the past in the past. There was a great story in the book um, about a woman who kept talking about her ex-husband. And she was just irate and she carried him around with her and her friend finally said to her, you might as well still be married to that man. You take him wherever you go. And mm -hmm. they had been divorced for such a long time. And all of a sudden she had an epiphany and she said, oh my gosh, I'm carrying him around with me. And you know, I like to think of lack of forgiveness as like this heavy cloak and you're wearing it on your shoulders and every single bad thing that you're still brooding over is like sewn onto that cloak, right? And that cloak weighs about 50 pounds and you're dragging along with that cloak on you. It's all behind you, but you're still carrying it with you going forward. Just shrug it off. It doesn't do you any good to keep brooding over it. It's in the past. Yes, it happened. It informs who you are, but you don't have to take it into your future. I, I love that metaphor of the cloak, don't you, Judy? I do, and I wonder, you know, how people, for me, forgiveness is such an important thing too, and, and I didn't learn that till later on in life, um, but I do wonder how people forgive, you know, someone who murders their child, <laughs> or, you know, and, and it's just, I feel like it gets so intense sometimes, and the anger is so wrapped up. Um, and almost a separate entity and, and a life on, it takes a life of its own, you know, aside from the forgiveness. So what would the first step be, you would say, to, um, for someone to take when they, you know, wanted to start forgiving someone who did something extraordinarily wrong to them, abuse or, you know, something that was really traumatic for them? And we do have a lot of stories about that. I bet. And sometimes you're just amazed that these people can find the forgiveness in them, but they do it out of self-preservation. Well, first thing you have to do is say, why did the person do that? 
was any something that had to do with myself, my child, whoever it was, what was in that person's own background? And sometimes just by learning, you know, people often are disappointed because their mothers abused them. They were physically abusive or verbally abusive. And then they find out, well, their mothers were raised that same way and their mothers were miserable. And they, hmm. they start to put it in perspective. If you don't take it personally as action that was direct, directed at you specifically, and you realize that, well, you were just, I don't know, a byproduct of that anger, an accidental victim, it probably cuts the hurt in half when it wasn't intentionally for you, specifically directed at you. So a lot of people use that. But sometimes you read these stories and you think, I don't know how you could ever forgive somebody for, say, murdering your child, driving drunk and killing your husband, whatever yeah. it was. Of course, I haven't experienced anything that terrible. But what they say is that they were in a prison and they just... Forgiving doesn't mean you're excusing the behavior of that other person, but it means you're saying, I'm putting it aside. It no longer is in my present, and it's certainly not going with me into my future. And they just do it. I don't know. I feel it's incredibly magnanimous of them. I can't well, this, even understand it myself. And this goes back to your book. It says right in the front cover, stories about putting the past in the past and moving forward. So I feel like sometimes it's not necessarily we shouldn't look at it as a black and white, oh, I'm forgiving and forgetting type of thing. But you know what? I'm going to put it in my past and I'm going to keep going and I'm going to, you know, try to hold on to the things now that are positive and not, not focus on that anymore. I, I feel like that's part of it too. You know, I don't really know why that forgive and forget is such a popular phrase because I don't think people should forget. I mean, it is part of what I was going to ask you that. Right? That's almost like saying, we recommend you have repressed memories, right? Right. <laughs> That's not a good thing. It shouldn't be forgive and Like they forget. say, delete your negativity. It's like, well, you can't just delete it. You can't just hit a button and delete it. <laughs> but you could, so let's see, forgive and forget could be for, forgive and move forward. So we have another F there. Forgive but, and put it in the past. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't forget either. Definitely not. But I don't know. I have nobody right now who I'm angry with because everybody who's done me wrong, even if I don't want to associate with that person anymore, or I'm saying, oh, that is a toxic person. I don't need any negativity in my life at all. I'm not angry with any of them because I usually have figured out what motivated them. You know, I, I can say, okay, she was horrible to me, but I understand it was because she was jealous of this other person. She had a really bad first marriage. Her husband beat her. She was anger triangling. You know, the anger triangle thing where they're really mad at one person, they take it out on another person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can always find a reason for it. And as soon as I find a reason for it, I can be so unemotional about it because I become detached from it and it no longer bothers me. And the other thing you can do, and I know this sounds a little snarky, but you can basically say, <laughs> well, here it comes. But hey, it's all girls here. You can just say, that person is completely irrelevant to me. That person is not relevant to my life. And when you decide they're not relevant, whoa, it's really hard for them to hurt you. Well, this I goes back that to that, that, that saying, you know, life is 90% what happens to you, right? What, what is it? 90%? Oh, 10% what happens to you, 90% how you react to it. Yeah, and that's, that's something that people have definitely talked about in the Forgiveness Fix book because often in their stories, they relate how they forgave somebody, but whatever behavior they were forgiving is actually still ongoing. We have a lot of that in stories about mothers-in-law. We had one story where the woman, her mother-in-law was driving her crazy. She was so bad to her daughter-in-law. She wouldn't even let her in the family photos after she was already the daughter-in-law, wasn't even the fiance. She still wasn't in the family photos. And it was just killing this woman. I mean, it was just on her all the time. It was like she was in the dark because she had turned out the lights herself. So she finally decided she was going to sit down at the computer and she actually spent days doing this. She typed up what she called the record of wrongs. And she <laughs> Yeah, she wrote down every single thing her mother-in-law had ever done to her, whether she did it intentionally or unintentionally. And then she looked at this whole list and she started deleting. She read an item, deleted it, read an item, deleted it. She deleted, I don't know, pages and pages of the record of wrongs. And then when she was done, 
somehow going forward, it was never going to bother her again. And she learned to appreciate what was good about her mother-in-law and just kind of ignore the bad stuff. Amy, I want to um, just give a shout out to Captain Marshall from Simple Fat Burn. She said, hi, Judy, Kristen, West, and Amy. Do you remember Captain Marshall? Oh, yes, Marshall? I do. Oh, my God. Yeah. She's so fit. I remember her calf muscles. I remember her. <laughs> she's got and, great legs. That's for and sure. high heels with those calf muscles. And I was thinking, I am never going to have those calf muscles. And I will never wear heels that high. <laughs> <laughs> and that's OK. And uh, she said, good to see you all on the show. Um, Chicken Soup for the Soul has been going strong since 1993. That's amazing. Annie Jacoby said, you're so brave, Amy. You are amazing, and your hair is beautiful. Ah, uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Anne Sicconi from White Horse Interiors. She's down in Atlanta also. She said, hi, everyone. Um, congratulations, Annie Jacoby. Amen. And they're just having a good time with our conversation because it's it's just so so true, Amy. Everything you're saying and you and you bring up so many good points of you know how to react to it and how to put it behind you and and the coke of of the coke the coat of weight yes. <laughs> that, yeah, you that were heavy coke. Yes, it is really inspiring, right, Kristen? It's totally inspiring and totally necessary. I mean, how often? If you think about just, you know, working and your mind drifts and, oh, so-and-so said this to me th three hours ago and that made me so angry. And you think about how much time and productivity you lose just kind of and ruminating energy. over stuff that's so trivial and, yeah. and, and just doesn't matter. And I think there also is a process, you know, your, your writer, Stephanie Pfeiffer Stone, made an observation in your book that says forgiveness is a lot like grief. And I think it's like stages, too. You don't just have to forgive in one fell swoop. You know, it's like stages. Did you find that to be true? Absolutely. Yourself, and there's, yeah, there's no set way. Like, I say you can do it instantly. But, you know, sometimes you want to wallow in it for a month. You know, you want to say, I'm going to just be mad for a month, and then I'm going to deal with it. You know, whatever works for you. Everybody has a different method. Some people write a letter. Stephanie, mm -hmm. in her story, she said, write a letter but then do not send it, just burn it. You know, and she had a bunch of techniques that she laid out in her story. Um, you know, it really is whatever works for you. You can just- Kristen, that. that's what you do, you burn it? Oh, I, it's a ritual. It's, <laughs> it's, I write it out. I, I, have, I have a little fire. I really enjoy watching it burn. <laughs> I, love wow. it, I never want to be on the wrong end of that paper. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to forgive myself for a lot of stuff too. And so I, I wrote stuff to myself that I needed to forgive in myself and burned it. But I, I think it's whatever resonates with you. And, and sometimes for me, I have to write it out and then I have to kind of affirm that things are different now. Well, everybody does talk about how light and buoyant they feel. And one piece of advice uh, that I got from this book is that if you're going to start this process of forgiveness, don't do it with a very fresh, new hurt. Take an older one where the emotions aren't so raw and new and try this on an older hurt until you master it and then use it on something new that's, that's more raw for you. So that, and I think that makes a lot of sense for all of these different processes. Try it on something where you're not as emotional and overwrought about it. Um, and that works for grieving also is to, First work through an older loss, and then when you've mastered that practice, do it for a newer loss. I, I think, think I still have to give advice and wise advice. Yeah, totally. I still have to forgive a fifth grade music teacher back there somewhere, but <laughs> um, <laughs> that's you an old one. Book. You need the book. I know, definitely. right? You yeah. know what? It's so funny because I feel like some of the biggest love, some of the biggest things I had to get over, I have. But I had a fifth grade music teacher and Mr. Evans, my high school music teacher, that I just can't ever, maybe I got to switch it to, you know what, I'm just never going to forget it and I got to let it go. How about that? <laughs> See, I'm learning from you. <laughs> okay, so we can do the snarky thing and think about They're Mr. Evans. They're not relevant. No, what, well, whatever he said, what motivated him? Was he a total loser? He, was he jealous? Was he a nasty guy? Was he really directing it at you? Or did he do that to lots of people? Or were you the most talented kid and he had to put you down because he was frustrated because he never had the career he wanted? 
There you go. I think that was it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, looking back, I think I think that was definitely it. See, you could take that off. I love it. Thank you. You taught me so much. See, you love <laughs> you always leave me with nuggets of wisdom. And we just love having you on the show. And and you know, when you have your next book out too, you have to come on and talk about it because it's such a great conversation. We have the short the show is a little shorter and now I'm regretting it because <laughs> I don't want to end. Um, but we do we are running out of time. And Amy, I think that you can get the forgiveness. Forgiveness Fix on Amazon and pretty much everywhere, I'm sure, right? That, that is true. It's at Walmart, it's Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, wherever you like to find your books. And I think you should pick up a few copies because this would make an incredible Christmas present. Um, and even, you know what I'm thinking, Amy? That when we have a Thanksgiving dinner, that this book should be passed around the table and read a couple of times of a couple of the stories in there because it's a big um, a conversation piece as well as great tool to learn from. So you thank might, you so much. Yeah, you might want to use it before you go to that awkward family get together that's coming up, folks. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right? At least get one person off your, your bad list. You know, you could practice these methods and feel a little more comfortable at Thanksgiving or Christmas with all those family members. Yeah, for sure. A lot, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these stories are uh, based on family members too. So completely uh, relevant to what, what you, what's going on at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's right. Sure. Well, thank you so much again, Amy. We appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Well, we, we love having you and we're definitely going to be, studying this i know i'm going to be studying this <laughs> i know for sure it's just you know i feel like when you read through these chicken soup for the soul books it's like every story is so different and has such a different um uh lesson to teach you mm -hmm. know and, and I, i'm sure that whoever reads it has a different perspective when they go through them Right, because you're not the same character in everybody else's life that you you are in your own life. Some people, you're the villain. You are the great big villain. You are, you are the the big bad in your own life. Hopefully, you're not the villain of your own life. You're the hero of your own life. But there are people who have issues with you just as much as you have issues with them. And and I think no, don't say that. Say it isn't so. <laughs> Well, and I think what a what Amy was speaking to is that you don't know why people hurt other people. You know, there's a saying, hurt people hurt people. And that's true. And you don't know what baggage and damage people have until you really get to know them. And that it's not always about you, even though you may feel the effects of their actions or inactions. And I, I think that's, a, that's sage advice that Amy gave us today, which we definitely need to um, carry over into the, the holiday season and beyond yeah take out that coat lift that weight <laughs> for sure and you know it's hard to forgive i think you know when you look back in your life and and you pick out the times when like my music teachers um you know when i was in school i feel like you know so much focus goes to that and and if we could just like it like we were talking about don't feel the need to delete it or just you know try to remove it but just observe it and absorb it and you know almost embrace it and let it go and that's that's a lot i know i've had to learn that through life a lot right and you have to extend empathy to yourself when you were going through that you were school aged you were still a kid you were more vulnerable in many respects than you are now you didn't have the tools you didn't have the perspective that you do now and i think that's why childhood wounds really really stay with people a long time is because you are maximally vulnerable and that's a whole conversation for a whole different day with Amy yeah again. for sure I guess yeah I could pick other people out of my life too but you're right I always go back to the, the childhood the teachers really who influenced me and I had a lot of good teachers too so that's a good thing but those two are just <laughs> yeah it happens so. Yeah, exactly. All right, The Forgiveness Fix on Amazon and everywhere, of course. It just came out yesterday. We're so excited to have Amy Newmark on. Uh, she's the editor-in-chief, of course, and best-selling author of the book. Uh, love it. And uh, stay with us for next week, same time, and we will see you then. Take care. <laughs>